Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Rewound Founder. In this episode, we have Amber Alec joining us. Amber is the co-founder and general partner of the Council Fund. She started her career at Apple, then worked at Snap, and you, so she worked at Snap before its IPO, and then also worked at companies like Cruise and Lyft and so much more. The Council Fund invests in legacy industries and in, it particularly invests in founders who are reshaping outdated in industries. So they have an incredible thesis which uh, guides their fund. Uh, the Council also runs an angel network of more than 150 angels who are operators. Amber being an operator herself. In this episode, we talk about what it is like investing as an operator. What do in- operators invest in? Why should founders really raise money from operators? Uh, raising a VC fund as an operator. How should founders prepare their fundraising st- strategies? And how should founders re- create their pitch decks? And so much more. This is an incredible episode. Do it. I hope you enjoyed it. Do listen to it till the very end. Thank you. So hey Amber, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Yeah, doing really well. Excited to be here today. Who is uh, Amber then? Who are you? Yeah, so I am I am a founding GP at uh, the Council Fund, which is a small pre-seed stage venture firm. Um, we focus on legacy industries, and so um, industries outside of the core tech industry and kind of finding companies that are building software for those. So think manufacturing, logistics, supply chain, healthcare, construction. Um, we really want to see more innovation in those areas and be the ones backing the founders um, doing those areas. So, yeah. Awesome. So a lot of what you at the council uh, really uh, emphasize on is being operators and then investing in companies. So you got all, most of you were, most of the investors that you guys have were operators and then they turn into investors. So what do you think makes a good operator turn investor? Honestly, I think a lot of different types of operators can be incredible investors, but I think the most important part is that um, they have an entrepreneurial spirit. So um, uh, typically I'll see, you know, um, at a particular company, um, there's a founder and and founders wear a lot of hats. So they could go on and found another company and they'll probably be even more successful on that one than they were at the last one. Um, similarly, they could go and start a venture firm or start angel investing and they would know a lot more that they did before they had founded that company. Um, but I think the first 10, 20, 30 people that also joined that founder on that first journey at that first company um, also have a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. And so I think that earlier the startup, um, whether that's pre-seed, seed, series A, I think that's really the time that you can learn the most. Um, and I honestly think it does continue through growth, growth stage because um, just having been at Cruise myself, when I look at my career, I, I started at Fortune 500 companies and worked my way all the way down to seed stage. So Cruise was kind of in the middle in terms of um, where I joined and where I left. So I, I joined when they were like 400 employees, less than they, when they were 2,500 employees. So it was well past Series A, but because the company was still changing so fast, like growing to that degree over a period of like three and a half years, um, the company just kept changing overnight. And so you had to be comfortable with ambiguity and change and um, the sorts of tough decisions that companies have to make in order to keep moving forward at that um, at that stage. And so I think folks that have had to work in environments like that that are not super stable yet um, and constantly adjusting to the macro environment Um, is it really makes great operator. And then um, in terms of functional expertise, I think there are also a lot of different flavors of this. So I've seen, um, you know, designers start angel investing and that's incredible because design is one of the first roles that you need to hire for. Um, Probably back, you know, as soon as you have a software engineer or an engineering team, next thing you should be thinking about is usually design um, if you haven't already. Um, And so it's one of those early roles that matters a lot at a startup. And so having an investor on your cap table as a founder that um, actually knows what good design looks like, knows how to hire a good designer, um, maybe could help, you know, advise on, you know, early design work, um, that goes a long way. And then, you know, you layer on more and more functions. So if you had an engineering background, you're valuable for all the same reasons. Um, If you're more of a generalist like me, um, you know, typically you wouldn't hire like an operations leader, um, you know, right out of the gate as a startup. But um, around the time that you're trying to scale from seed to series A, you're starting to break at the seams. You have only seven employees and you're trying to get to 30 or something. And so um, having somebody on board who has been a hiring manager, knows how to hire people, uh, when's it time to let people go, what's normal, what's not, 
um, how do you run an all hands, things like that um, matter. So, you know, I could, I could sing praise for every single function, whether it's finance, marketing, legal, um, it's all going to become relevant at some point. So most important thing is that you just have that entrepreneurial spirit and you've been inside of a fast paced changing environment before, and it's not going to be your first rodeo. I think people that have worked at only really stable companies are sometimes shocked by the level of change going on inside of the startups that they are invested in. Um, whereas if you've been in an environment like that before, you kind of know that that's normal. Yeah. Uh, the, the, there's some incredible point. And I think, are, are, is it tougher to get into investing as a generalist, uh, as a generalist, instead of having a specific expertise in something which a startup requires? I think um, on paper, yes. I think that if you have specialized expertise, like you know, you're a designer, you're um, an engineer, um, you're a legal person that can help everybody with all their legal paperwork. Um, I think that it gives you an easy answer in terms of where you can best help startups. And so it's very clear to other people what you can help them with. It's clear to founders. If you're raising your own fund, it's clear to LPs. Um, but I think that doesn't mean that there aren't really great ways that generalist uh, investors can exist or help founders. Um, I think then you just need to get really clear on how are you differentiated and how are you going to make that clear to the rest of the world? Because that's not immediately clear from like, you know, flashing up your LinkedIn for one second. So um, I think that's why, you know, as a generalist myself that's gone into VC, I spent a lot of time investing in my personal brand and making sure that I, every single founder that works with me has a great experience. Um, and if somebody else would, you know, call those founders up and ask them, should I take a check from Amber? I want all of them to be like, yes, Amber is the most helpful and uh, like friendly investor on my cap table. And so um, I honestly think it puts more pressure on the generalist investors to uh, really stick out. And sometimes that can be a good thing. You you joined Snub before the IPO. So what do you think uh, is different between companies that uh, it had a relatively it had a very successful IPO, uh, Snub? What do you think do companies like those have in different the, in comparison to other companies that you might have seen in your investing journey when you started investing? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of every company's unique. Um, one thing that I thought was unique about Snap and Apple, actually both, like the, they share this common factor, which is that the CEO is a product person and the CEO is almost like a designer at heart. Um, and so I think the thing that I walked away with from Snap um, and after seeing that pattern match at, you know, from Apple to Snap, because everybody, you know, talks about Steve Jobs, we, everyone knows a ton about him. We know that he was obsessed with the product and he had his hands really, really deep in the product. Um, and again, I saw that at Snap. And so um, you have to wonder, you know, Evan, I think he he went straight from Stanford to launching Snap. And so even when I was there years after the company had been founded, he was only 27 years old as a CEO or going through an IPO, I believe. And so... Um, you, you have to wonder like how somebody that young can be that successful. Um, and I really do think that it was that like maniacal focus on the product and um, not having too many layers when it came to like design and, and product and um, really having like a quick feedback loop from like this, the visionary of the company down to the, the team and like hiring, of course, visionary designers and visionary design leaders. Um, but there weren't many product managers like in both companies. I think there were some in both, but um, it wasn't like, you don't know who's actually designing the product anymore because there are so many layers of product leadership. So um, that was that was um, kind of an observation I had there. It's just like any company I work with going forward, whether I'm investing in them or joining them, I want that leader to be obsessed with the end product. Um, and I think that's gone a long way, both in terms of like the other companies I joined. Cruise was very similar. Um, you know, Kyle Vogt, he is, it's not like he came in with a technical background and he was a, a repeat founder having founded Twitch. Um, but it wasn't like he was like, since I'm a technical founder, I'm only going to focus on the technology. No, he wanted to know about the end customer experience. He wanted to have an opinion on that and spend a lot of time on that in addition to all the massive work that was going on in the engineering team. So um, I think just like that, that focus on the end user's experience is really important. Is there, is there a difference between the fundraising strategies that some of these relatively successful companies have uh, versus what we see in uh, other companies? Definitely. So, um, you know, I don't know. I wasn't around for the Snap fundraise or like the early cruise fundraises, but definitely for Atmos, I was around uh, when they raised their Series A and they had just raised their seed um, when I came in. And 
Um, and then I've seen at this point thousands of pitch decks to probably talk to about you know thousand um, founders throughout the past five years. Um, and so because I end up investing in ten per year, and I do see differences in terms of the companies that get funded very easily versus the companies that take a longer time to fundraise. Um, and a lot of times, obviously, network plays a big uh, part there. And so some people come in with an unfair advantage and it's like they're already chummy with folks at the top tier firms um, or they have their family backing them or something and they can get a lot farther um, by the time they're fundraising. They already have like 300K ARR and they're like leading their pre-seed round um, and they haven't had to raise any capital. Um, so putting that st sort of stuff aside that, you know, creates a lot of bias in the process um, and and kind of unfair circumstances. Um, putting that aside, like if you're looking at two people kind of fundraising um, and the fundraisers I've seen be most successful, I think it involves a lot of research up front. So um, like I, I think founders that are like, hey, I'm going to start fundraising tomorrow and I'm going to reach out um, every day to new people to try to fill my pipeline with more leads. And they just kind of like turn it on and go. Um, I think those fundraisings tend to um, kind of drag out because you're constantly waiting on the next intro. Um, and by the time you're getting to an end of a conversation with one VC, you're starting to get an intro to the other. Um, or maybe you've gotten too focused on one VC and you're not thinking about the other. Um, whereas the companies that have fundraised really well, they spend you know maybe a week or, or two doing research on who are the VCs in my space and the angels in my space and the angel groups in my space that I want to be pitching, um, who actually funds companies this early um, or at my particular stage um, or in my sector. And they, they make a list and then they send it to everybody they know and they say, let me know, put your name in this spreadsheet if you can introduce me to somebody at this firm. And if you see somebody who's not on this firm that you do know, please write them in at the bottom um, as somebody you'd like to introduce me to. Um, and then they actually kick it all off at once. They might do like a few cohorts if they have like 60 people on the list. Like maybe it's like, I'm going to reach out to those 20 people at the top that said that they had an intro for me uh, week one and then week two, 20 more, week three, 20 more. Not everybody's going to be as responsive as they said that they were going to be. And so there will be a fallout there. And that's why you want to do bigger cohorts. Um, and honestly, kicking them all off at once could be a good idea because of that. And because if you get to the end of the fundraise, and you do get a term sheet, which is amazing. Um, the next best amazing thing, or even more amazing thing, um, you know, to have a second term sheet and be able to play them off of each other. So I give the same advice to my friends looking for a new job as I do to founders trying to get, you know, find out who, who is going to lead their seed round. Um, is you want to have multiple options, so kick them off at the same time and don't get too attached to any one. Um, it looks a lot worse if you get to the end of a process with a VC and they give you a term sheet and built this whole relationship. And then they see you going around and shopping that around in, in all sorts of new conversations and then asking them for like a three week extension so that you can go have all these other relationships be built. Um, and so I've seen founders actually take terms they weren't excited about because they didn't want to do that. And they regretted not having kicked off the process with more VCs early on in the process. So Anyways, I also think that the VCs that you're talking to and the angels that you're talking to feel that momentum. If it seems like you're talking to 60 other people or five other top firms, um, they feel that even if you're not uh, name dropping, they can tell you're running a process and um, you have boundaries, you have you know guidelines, and um, they they kind of act accordingly. Whereas if you're like, yeah, you know, I'm just kind of starting off and we'll see where it goes, um, they're like, oh, I have all the time in the world. I'll you know I'll I'll think about this and just let it simmer on the back burner for the next two months or something or three weeks. So um, I do think it makes a difference just the, the sort of tone you set and the process that you run. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that, that's incredible. That's, but so how do you decide whom to raise money from versus whom not to raise money from? Like, depending upon also the fund size. So should you raise money from larger VC funds or smaller VC funds, micro VC funds? How do you decide? The, how does the founder decide? Yeah, so, um, so I think it depends where you're at as a company. So if you don't have uh, any revenue yet, maybe you have an MVP, um, that I would look for like true pre-seed firms. And I say true pre-seed firms because I think now a lot of uh, VCs are saying they're pre-seed firms, um, but they really do want to see a couple hundred um, uh, thousand dollars in ARR. Um, and so if you are truly pre-revenue and you do need to raise money that early, um, I would look for the firms that are really advertising themselves as investing at the earliest stage. Um, so the council fund 
um, invest fairly early, um, but you have to be a proven operator in order for us to take that risk on you. And we can get into what that means later. Um, I also know 43, their website is 43.io and then underdog labs love getting in early, love supporting founders and getting really hands on or then that early. Um, and then if you can afford to bootstrap for just a little while and get to 200 or 300 K ARR, um, and, and then go raise a pre-seed round formally, um, there are a ton of firms out there and a lot of emerging VCs out there that invest in pre-seed rounds. Um, and so I think I would include them in your search if you are pretty much anybody that advertises themselves at pre-seed, you will naturally fall into their category if you're at that, um, at that, uh, run rate. And so, um, I think it just depends where you're at. And then the other option, if you're like at the earliest stage, like pre-revenue, um, another option is going for angels. Um, that said, I think people think of angels as like a replacement for friends and family, but that's not always true. Um, I run a group of 150 um, all-female, all-operator angels from companies like Square, Slack, Airbnb, Lyft, et cetera. Um, and they're all incredible, but I have noticed that the deals that get more traction with them actually have more traction because some of them, you know, they're aware that they're not institutional investors and they're not doing as much due diligence on these deals as um, a, a full-time VC would. And so for them, it makes them feel a little bit better if there's already some traction um, by the time they're investing. So they tend to get really excited at that later pre-seed stage and then at seed stage. That is kind of a hot take because I, I hear a lot of other people saying like, oh, just go for angels if you don't have any traction. But I think the more uh, sophisticated the angel investor, the more they probably want, do want to see a little bit of traction. Um, and and yeah, that's not true for everyone. Um, I was obviously very comfortable at, at really early stage as an angel, but um, something to think about if you're a founder. What what makes a sophisticated angel? What differentiate a uh, differentiate a sophisticated angel from just uh, normal angel investor that gives you money to build something? Yeah, maybe sophisticated is not the the nicest term because I think both can be sophisticated. But some some angels are, um, I guess the the word that we use is just like more aware of like portfolio construction and um, like the risk that they're taking on, um, and so. I think some are aware of the time that they have and the bandwidth that they have, and they realize that you can't go through a full blown due diligence process on your entire industry and you as a founder and everything. And they know they have to make quick decisions to get into rounds sometimes. Um, and because of that, they're like, you know what, I'm going to opt out of this one because it doesn't have enough uh, traction for me to be able to move fast. Um, and uh, I also don't want to take up too much of this founder's time because I'm not writing a huge check. It might be a 20K check or 10K check even a 5k check as an angel investor. Um, so I don't want to have like five calls with this founder or three calls with this founder. Um, if you know, I'm basically could be wasting their time at the end of the day. And so I think that's the the mindset that I see from a lot of angels. And then, um, I think there's some other angels that they're okay. Like maybe they are, um, maybe they have a larger set of capital to work with and they want to go into VC. In some ways, the earlier ones might be more sophisticated because they're comfortable taking that, uh, risk, but like, um, maybe they're wanting to go into VC someday. They haven't yet launched their first fund. And so they are designing an angel portfolio and they are thinking through, um, hey, I want to invest in 30 to 50 companies before I launch my first fund. So I'm like, I want to show that I can get into pre-seed rounds. I want to show that I can um, basically identify talent early on before everybody else sees it and before it gets a huge markup. Um, I want to see that my check can go farther than the average uh, investor. And so um, I think if somebody's positioning them that way, themselves that way, and they're putting themselves out there as an angel individually, um, that might be somebody that you want to target. So, um, and also that entrepreneurial spirit, have they worked for a startup before? Like, do they understand what they're getting into? Would they be feel comfortable vetting somebody like me who is at the earliest stages? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think folks that are great at talent recognition, honestly, I've seen a lot of angels that have people ops backgrounds or HR backgrounds go into um, angel investing and they tend to be like some of the generalist angels tend to be more comfortable um, investing at such an early stage because they have been people managers they've worked at early stage companies and they um, they know how to spot um, you know what sort of founder could like um, you know handle the waves that are coming their way and um, they're more comfortable in that less data driven environment where it's a lot of intuition validated by data but you don't have the same number of data points that you're going to have at seed or series A. So that's something to consider too. Yeah. I, I mean, related to the, just a personal question that I think 
uh, is it important for people who want to potentially start VC funds? For example, you you started out as an angel. Could you have gone or raised the same pre-seed for the same VC fund without starting out as an, as an angel investor versus it directly getting into uh, becoming a GP and all this? Yeah, so I think it would have been really tough um, because I think having invested my own capital um, and I was writing fairly small checks, um, but I did have to work for years to feel comfortable doing that and like carve off a piece of my portfolio to do that. Um, but I think it really helps the conversation to show that I'm serious and I've really devoted a lot of time to this. I had built an angel community that was driving unique deal flow. I had shown that I was a good picker um, and had like a 6.8 uh, markup on that portfolio. Um, and then I had shown that I could get into top deals. So like the top three things you want to show as an emerging manager or any manager really is I have unique deal flow. I'm a good picker and I can win deals and actually get into the ones that I want to fund. Um, and so I had a lot of stories about that within 30 portfolio companies as an angel. There were a lot of stories I could tell when I went out to go and raise my first fund. That said, track record is not everything because um, LPs know that what you did before is not necessarily going to be what you're going to be capable of in the future. The environment changes, your network changes, um, you as an investor are constantly um, growing. And so ideally you're getting better over time, but they don't know that. And so they're curious, like, what's the ongoing go-to-market strategy to keep getting that incredible deal flow, keep picking the best winners, um, and keep getting into the best deals as you grow? Because um, for me, it was like my check size was going from like 5K to 100K with this venture fund. And so... Um, I had to show, I had to prove it to LPs. I can actually write a larger check into these rounds. And I'm st without still being the lead investor, um, I can still get into these rounds. Um, and in some environments, that's easier to do. In some environments, that's harder to do. So, um, so yeah, I would say the track record helped me. And I personally, just knowing who I am, I probably wouldn't have felt comfortable um, raising a fund if I didn't have that because I didn't have a VC background, didn't have a finance background. So it was like, I have an operator background, um, but I didn't, you know, found uh, Uber. And I also, um, yeah, so it, it was like, you know, what, what is going to be my special sauce? So I want to show that I've built something already by the time I'm launching this um, to show how serious I am about it. And and actually prove to myself that I feel comfortable taking LPs money and investing that. So, yeah. Do, do. LPs also look at your uh, operating experience or the operator VC side of things, do your LPs also, do the LPs also look at that? Yeah, I think certain LPs do. Um, it depends on the LP background, but I think more and more you're seeing a lot of LPs that are excited about um, books that have been inside of a company and understand the way that it works and understand, you know, what a successful founder looks like, what an unsuccessful founder looks like, um, and the sort of pitfalls that can happen along the way. Um, and so I've seen a lot of LPs, the reason they've invested in the council fund is because they're excited about that. Yeah. I had Michael Kim from Sindana Capital on. Uh, he runs the Fund of Funds. Uh, yeah, I've met so, him. He's also. Yeah, he's yeah, exactly. yeah. uh, So he actually told me that at Fund of Funds, they actually at Sindana, they look at the track record of the investor. So what kind of, in what investment experience the uh, GP or the fund manager has. So I think... When do fund of funds actually come in during the, during the fundraise process for a VC fund? Yeah, so I mean, as soon as possible. So um, a firm like Sandana, they're investing in pre-seed companies, or sorry, pre-seed focused venture funds. They love emerging funds and they love small um, small firms. So um, honestly, I don't think there's, it's not like too soon to talk to them. I would say um, because their name is out there, um, like they get a lot of inbound. And so the challenge is finding other fund of funds like Sendana that are doing the same thing because I think it's a newer way of thinking. Um, a lot of more established um, fund of funds and um, institutional family offices or VCs with fund of funds. Um, actually, I would say VCs with fund of funds are they they kind of think the same way as Sendana, where they're like, um, we understand that small funds can outperform. We understand that pre-seed can vastly outperform, and that risk reward really pays off um, from getting in that early. But I still think like the the old school um, LP network, and which is the bulk of firms out there, have not yet fully um, adopted that um, that way of thinking. Um, sometimes you'll talk to uh, like a very official fund of funds that you know that's all they've been doing for the past two decades, and um, they are uh, they're like, oh yeah, we love emerging managers, um, and you ask them what an emerging manager means, and they say uh, that means like funds three through four. 
or something like that. And then um, you ask them, what does a small fund mean? And they mean uh, any fund under 100 million, but they won't talk to you if you're a, if you're under 50. And so I don't know a lot of emerging managers that are launching funds that are um, 50 million and above. And I know very, I know a lot that are raising 10 million or below, which is almost like completely out of bounds for most institutional LPs and fund of funds that I talk to. So um, I definitely think Sendana and some other smaller, like more emerging, Sendana's big, but like there are other smaller um, emerging fund of funds that are doing the same thing. And I think they're onto something because um, there is a lot of data that shows emerging managers outperform, small funds outperform. Um, but it just hasn't caught on. There's there's kind of an optics issue around it. And then some of these bigger firms that ha- have like $3 billion under management or something, they physically can't write a big enough check into your fund because they don't want to have too high of an ownership percentage in your fund. Like if I'm raising a $5 million fund and they're trying to write a $5 million check into every single investment, they can't invest in my fund because they don't want to own 100% of it. So um, I think that's the rub is a lot of them have not carved off like special case vehicles for this yet. Um, and they also don't have the bandwidth to manage it because it's a lot of, you know, if you have $3 billion and you're trying to invest in a bunch of, you know, $10 million funds or $5 billion, $5 million funds at a $1 million check size, A, the return on any given fund might not be big enough to return their vehicle. And B, they don't have enough people to manage all those relationships for all those managers. So it's definitely a problem um, within the LP ecosystem. So you really, at, at every fund size, you need to figure out like who are the firms that are actually in my category. And that really develops over time because it's an opaque industry. So it's like people introduce you to people who introduce you to people and you do uncover these over time. Um, but it's definitely a very like, it's almost like an enterprise sales process trying to get into the right doors, work on those relationships, prove to them over time that you're worth investing in. You talked about fund of funds there, but who are the actual or the mo- most more common LPs and funds these days? Or yeah. Uh, is that, so, true? Yeah. So for fund ones and especially small funds. So I am I have a $5 million target fund size and um, I could end up with a fund of 3 million to 5 million at the end of the day. Um, and so for me, it's made sense to raise from a lot of individuals and then VCs who have fund of funds. Um, so individuals invest because they want access. They want a diversified portfolio working for them in the background. They want a huge return. And so um, those high net worth individuals love investing in fir- firms like the council fund because they can buy into a thesis, trust the manager um, to go then do all the work in terms of sourcing the deals, diligencing the deals, getting access to those deals for the portfolio. And then sometimes I'll even open up SPVs if some of my LPs want to double down on those um, portfolio companies. But if they don't have the time um, or attention on those deals, they know that I will have written a big enough check in that it could you know, return the fund and um, produce an outlier return if that company lives to its full potential. And so they don't have to participate after that initial check into the fund to know that it's working for them. Um, and then VC fund of funds like Bain Capital Ventures and Asymmetric Capital Partners that have invested in me, um, of course, they want the fund to perform well, but they are also interested in just getting more deal flow. Um, so it's interesting to see most of the tier one venture firms out there right now have these sort of official or unofficial funded firms programs going on because they know that Emerging managers like me have eyes and ears on the ground. Um, and no matter how much capital they have or how big their team is, they can't possibly be in every single corner of the tech ecosystem. And they want to know that they're seeing all the deals to be able to select the best um, and at least all the good deals to be able to select the best. And so um, they look for alignment and overlap in thesis. So they're looking for fund managers that have almost the exact same thesis as them or at least cross into the same sectors as them. So um, Bain Capital Ventures invested in the council funds because we invest in legacy industries like logistics, supply chain, construction. We love un- industrial automation. Um, we love prop tech. They really love these sort of game changing, um, you know, areas that are massive markets and have been kind of underserved in the past. Um, and I'm seeing that happen more and more with VC firms that are getting really excited about those areas. Um, and that's leading to really exciting opportunities um, for my fund because they can invest in me. We have a formal deal flowing deal flow sharing relationship. Um, they can learn about companies earlier than they would have potentially invested in them. So I invest at pre seed and seed. They invest at seed through growth stage, and so um, I could be giving them you know information about companies that I'm investing in at pre seed, and they're getting my quarterly updates, and they can keep track of those companies. So um, it's a way for them to access um, you know new uh, territory. And then family offices, I constantly hear from folks that they're amazing for emerging managers. But I would say if you don't come from that environment, if you didn't come from finance where you are working with family offices from some other angle before this, 
or you didn't come from a super wealthy uh, background where you just knew family offices growing up, um, it's really hard to know who they are and what they want to invest in and even how to get in touch with them because they don't advertise themselves online. They're not like, I mean, there are a couple that do, but for the most part, a lot of families are looking for privacy. They don't want to flaunt their wealth. And so um, they, uh, you know, it, it takes time to really like put yourself out there and talk to a lot of individual LPs. And for me, that's a lot of these high net worth individuals that invest in my fund. Over time, I build rapport with them. And then, of course, somebody's like, oh, you should talk to my neighbor. They manage a family office. Or, um, you know, you should come to my, uh, you know, LP event. I'm going to invite three of my family offices. I'm a, a GP in another fund. Um, and I think they would really like you, too. Um, so I think those sort of things happen over time. Um, and if you can get into those relationships, those can be very valuable um, just because they don't have as strict sometimes of requirements as the institutions do in terms of like, we have to invest in this one particular sector and we have to write check sizes of this one particular amount. Um, I think they can be a little bit more flexible based on what the family itself is interested in. Um, but there are that even within that, there are like a million different flavors of family offices. They always say, if you've met one, you've met one, you have not met them all. Um, so some are more institutionally managed and kind of function more like an institution with an emerging manager program. It's very defined. Some are still managed by the family members themselves. And so there's a whole spectrum um, of everything in between. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an incredible point. So how do you build relationships relationships with people? Like it, it, take, it does take a lot of time to do that. No one will give you money on the first day, but yeah. how do you do that over time? Yeah. So before I even get into how, I love that you asked that question because I think a lot of fund managers put pressure on themselves um, and they think it's just going to happen overnight or it's going to happen in six months or maybe even 12 months. Um, but the average fund really does take two years to raise, especially in this environment. I think I saw a, a report from First Republic RIP um, that said the average second fund takes 18 months to raise. Um, and so that just goes to show, you know, it is a marathon. And part of the reason it's a marathon is exactly what you just said. Somebody isn't going to invest after you had one call with them. An individual might. Individuals do move fast. So I've had a lot of people um, commit on the spot because they're deploying their own capital and they can feel comfortable doing that. But um, the larger the institution gets, the larger the check size gets, and the more process they have and the more controls they have in place um, to make sure that they're, you know, being really thorough. Um, and and also they don't want to, they get pitched all the time. And so it's not exciting to them if it's just really transactional. It's like, here's what I'm building. You should invest because I'm going to be an outlier manager. Everybody's saying that to them. Um, and so they want to know what, what makes you different. They also want to know that they like working with you because it's like at least a 10, 10 year uh, relationship and ideally more because ideally they'll invest in your fund two, fund three, et cetera. Um, and so they're really, it's almost like searching for a suitor. Um, it's like a, a marriage thing almost. And so um, they really do want to get to know you. So um, there are a couple different things I do. If I have the chance to meet somebody in person, I take it. Um, I, you know, I try not to travel for somebody that's not really serious. But if somebody is really getting into diligence, um, you know, I will make a trip for that and want to meet them face to face because I know that will go a long way. Um, also, if I find a strategic conference where it's not super focused on transactional relationships um, and it's more focused on just getting to know each other, um, and by default there will be a lot of LPs there. Um, I'll go to things like that and not pitch while I'm there and just kind of get to know people and then follow up with them afterward to see based on our discussion, maybe there could be some interest there and we should connect one-on-one. -on -one. Um, another thing is sharing deals with folks. So, um, you know, sharing deals with them before you ask for something in return versus being like, I'll only share deals with you if you invest in my fund. Um, I think that goes a long way. Um, and they get to see how you think about deals over time. So another thing you can do is add them to your quarterly updates. So. I send updates every single quarter to my LPs, but I'm also sharing it with like 10 to 20 potential LPs that um, I think would be huge for my firm if we got on board in this fund or the next fund. And I want them to see how consistent I am quarter to quarter. I want them to see the little mini deal memos I put in my quarterly updates so that they can see how, how and why I make the decisions I do. Um, and that just builds trust with them over time, trust and credibility. And that's all I can ask for. And then I'm also going to be inviting those LPs to my LP summit, which will be my first LP summit ever. Um, but planning something in mid November and I want them to actually, you know, to the extent that they can have the, um, opportunity to come and meet me in person and also meet the community of LPs around us because it's a really incredible, um, community of movers and shakers that anybody would be lucky to know. So, um, so yeah, I want them to, to feel that full experience. So I think you build a relationship with the LPs, you 
launched the VC fund. Uh, I'll drift here a little bit. So, in regards to this, uh, how do you invest as an operator? Uh, what does an imp- operator look for in a startup versus what normal investors would look at it in a different way? Yeah. So it's going to be different from every person to every person, but as an operator myself, what I look for, like given my experiences are, um, of course, I'm going to go through a checklist of everything about the company make sure I understand what is their go-to-market strategy, their competition, et cetera. Does the founder really understand the competition? And um, all that stuff is important and I'll get there. But on the first call, what I really want to understand is who is this person? Why are they doing it? Um, and do they have three things? Um, resilience, mission, and vision. So, um, who is the person and why are they doing this is really important because it helps me understand that personal mission piece and a little bit of the resilience piece. So I want to make sure that they're resilient because I've seen that, um, you know, things can come out of left field and threaten a company. Um, and so I want to know that this person is not going to give up the first time they feel like they're operating in a, uh, ambiguous environment or have a blank new sheet of paper that they need to, uh, design something from, um, and that they know, you know, they can make it through every obstacle if they want to, or if they have the opportunity to. Um, and so that resilience is really important to me. I want to make sure that they've been through the trenches before, which means they're a proven operator. Um, and that could be that they were early at a company or they joined a company when it was really changing from one stage to the next. I'm less excited about the folks that have been at the Apples and the Eli release than I am about the people that have been from the yeah. cruises and the uh, Atmos, because I know they've seen a lot and Every single time I'd go to a smaller company, everybody would be like, this is a shit show here, don't you think? Um, and it just would show me like, wow, people, everybody's transitioning to smaller companies is constantly shocked uh, at how crazy it is. Um, but sometimes that craziness is actually what makes it successful at the end of the day. Um, not craziness in a bad way, like, you know, HR issues and stuff like that. Um, but more just like things are changing so fast and a lot of people have trouble keeping up with that. Um, and even as a hiring manager at Cruise, I talked to tons of people that I was thinking about hiring for my team. Um, and then I also had coworkers that would join and decide to leave after like six months or a year because they just couldn't take that level of change. Like they didn't want to deal with an org change every six to 12 months. Um, and they didn't want to deal with having five different managers in the same year. Um, and that, I d- of course, is not ideal. But um, all those things happen for strategic strategic reasons and the folks that were able to really navigate through those changes were the ones that I think are entrepreneurial enough to go and found their own company um, and and not be freaked out uh, when that's the reality internally. Um, and then mission is really important. Um, and that, that gets back to the like, the why are you doing this? Um, yeah. Because if they don't have a personal connection to what they're building, um, they're going to give up again when, the first time it gets hard. Like, so when uh, the, like, Big blocks have happened in the market, like SBF, uh, you know, fraud that happened in the crypto industry. So everybody that had made a ton of money in crypto no longer has much money. Um, and that impacted all sorts of sectors. Um, and and then also the SVB crisis, like things like that. Um, somebody might be like, you know what? It's going to be really hard to make money in this business for the next 12 months or 24 months. And I thought that it was going to be easy. I'm going to just give up now. But if you're working on something that... Um, is really important to you personally, you're not going to give up that easily. Um, So one example of a founder that I funded as an angel um, that I am really, really bullish on, obviously, is Alex Alvarado. Um, He's the CEO of Daybreak Health. Um, I was one of the first checks into the company. And after that, we got into Y Combinator, then uh, SoftBank and Nathan Ventures participated in the seed, then Lightspeed to Series A, then Lux Capital and uh, USB at Series B. So the company has done extremely um, well, but you know, one of the reasons that, um, he founded the company to begin with, which was in the mental health space for teens was that he had a personal experience in his family, um, with a teen struggling with mental health. And so I knew, um, he has all the right things on paper. He's been a product manager at multiple exited, um, startups. He's been in those high growth periods. And so he's shown that resilience, um, inside of other companies. But as a founder himself, this is his life's mission um, to solve this so that things that happen to his family member will not happen to other folks in the same boat. Um, and so um, that told me that he has a personal mission. And then um, a company I was not excited about, I won't name, but um, this has happened many times where a founder will jump on a call and I ask, why are you doing this? And they say, well, I was working in my job at investment banking and I saw all these different industries and I noticed that uh, construction was a huge market. And then I noticed that this one industry within uh, construction was not being 
Um, it didn't have that many competitors and seemed really lucrative because these people would pay for this, but the brokers were getting that. And uh, I could come in and do this arbitrage opportunity and um, make a lot of money. Um, that does not excite me because if they aren't making a lot of money or don't, you know, if there's a period of time where it seems like things get rough, um, that person's out. And um, I don't think money is enough to motivate people to keep going with startups because it's not always a success story. And even the biggest successes have near failures. So um, that's something that is an instant write-off for me and in terms of not wanting to continue the conversation. Um, and then the third thing that I look for is vision. So I, and this is different from VC firm to VC firm. Some VCs are really, you know, they want to have a lot of acquisitions in their portfolio that happen early on and they want to have a larger portion of, a larger hit rate um, or higher hit rate in their portfolio. Um, but a lot of VCs like me, um, what we want to see is, if any one out of 10 companies becomes a huge winner and the other nine just went to complete zero overnight, that one has to be potential um, to be huge and potentially make it through an IPO. It might be a $1 billion company. It might be a $5 billion company. It might be a $10 billion company. We have to believe that that is possible. Um, and it's not going to be possible if, again, you have a founder that um, just kind of wants to make a lot of money in the short to medium term and get out. Um, we we really want somebody that has a big vision. So. When I ask, like, how do you see the world in five to 10 years? Um, I want to hear, like, XYZ will not exist in the world in five to 10 years because of the product that we're building. Or um, hourly workers are going to be getting paid on time within construction. I'm talking about Square Dash, uh, one of our companies we got excited about. Um, they're building a cash flow SaaS tool for um, roofing company owners. And then um, they are, because of that and their cash advanced product, um, Roofers, while they're waiting for insurance claims to clear, can pay their hourly workers on time. And they don't, they're not like constantly on the verge of going bankrupt or not paying people on time because they're waiting on insurance claims to clear. And so things like that, it's like you ask somebody like that, how do you see the world in five to 10 years? And it's like uh, roofers aren't going out of business the second there's like a housing crisis um, and hail and wind damage is able to be repaired on time uh, with hourly workers um, getting paid on time. Um, and so anyways, there's, there's a lot of positive impact there. And so I think, um, if you want a huge outcome as a VC, you have to believe that every single company in your portfolio has that potential to be a game changing company. Um, and it has the, and the founder isn't going to give up early because they want to see that full vision come to life. So, um, so yeah, I'm kind of looking for the founders that want to spend the next 10 plus years of their life on something and want to see it reach its full potential versus kind of sell it off early. Of course, it's nice to have acquisition as an opportunity along the way. Um, should things not be going well, but I don't want that to be like their number one goal and vision to just like exit as fast as possible. Yeah, yeah. The so these three things I think a lot of investors look at. I've had a couple on board, and a lot of points do resonate with a lot of them. Uh, then common, uh, they're commonly using the uh, like the VC marketer would call, but as a uh, Small, small fund. So you guys had a five million dollar debut fund. Uh, why does that mean that smaller funds have to make decisions more uh, diligently as compared to larger funds because they have a limited amount of money on the hands? So um, how do you do? Certainly, that? yeah. Certainly, fund expenses. Yes, I would say on the startup side, um, it's the same thing at a different level of scale, and there's a lot of different factors on whether you can get into rounds at higher check sizes or lower ch check sizes and things like that. Um, but you're going to portfolio construction is portfolio construction. So you could invest in 30 companies over three years with a $5 million fund or a $25 million fund. It's just going to scale up your check size. Um, and you know, there will be different reasons for that, but, um, but the, um, wait, I'm trying to get back to the original question. Um, Oh, do you have to be more diligent? Um, so on the expense side, yes, you cannot go or actually I don't suggest going with like the top, top firm for a law out there because um, they're going to charge you like 100K for fund formation. I've I've seen even 150K uh, charge for fund formation and that money is coming out of fund expenses. So that's 150K you can't invest in startups because you just put it into um, your fund formation, which is a one time fee year one. And then anytime you need to contact your lawyer as general counsel to ask about um, you know, a, a term sheet or a some sort of document you need reviewed or a transition you want to make with your firm, um, they're going to try to do their hourly fee and it's going to be exorbitant. So um, 
I I think that you need to be careful with like which legal team you choose. You also don't want to go with like bottom of the barrel, no venture experience um, sort of team because you don't want to make any mistakes and fund one. Um, and you want LPs you're talking to in fund two and fund three to be proud of the way that you led your firm in fund one. So you really do have to look at a spectrum of vendors out there and pick somebody kind of in the middle that seems like a good fit for you um, and be careful with expenses. Um, it's very hard to hire um, anybody to be working on the team with you that's not just getting paid and carry. Um, and so for me, I have additional revenue stream coming from our angel investing community. And so I, I have a little bit of extra um, flex there, but um, even that is really tight. So I have to be really smart with the way that I'm spending money. Um, and even with management fees, which um, you know, in a larger firm would be going toward the GP salary. For me, I'm being very careful with that. Um, I have not paid myself a salary yet. It's been now one year working on this full time. Um, which is a very privileged thing to say. And the only reason I'm able to do that is because I worked for 10 years and had like small to medium sized liquidity events um, and I'm investing myself now. Um, and so that that's very tough to do. Um, I know some folks that are, are paying them out of the, themselves out of their management fees right now with $5 million funds. Um, and that's just, um, you know, something that they're, they're going to do. And in theory, I can pay myself. So I am charging 2% management fees and 20% carry. But in practice, uh, I'm basically deferring as many things as I can right now because um, if some sort of surprise expense comes up in year three or four that I wasn't expecting, I don't want to be caught off guard. Um, I want to make sure that we're like, you know, well set up from a capital perspective to do that. So, um, yes, you have to be very careful with how you're budgeting with a fund one and a small fund. Yeah, that's that's that, that's a very good point. And I think in, in relation to this, uh, we're talking about uh, op- investing as an operator. So, should uh, founders build different pitch decks or different people? So, my take on this is personally no. Um, and, and maybe that's a contrarian take. I think some people would say yes. But honestly, I think it's just too much to maintain. You have so many things to be doing as a founder. Um, you're building your company internally. You're selling your company out externally to customers. And then you're also fundraising. Um, and so, if you have like five different flavors of your pitch deck, um, it's going to get unruly anytime you need to make a change. And people do give you feedback constantly along the way, either as a founder or as a VC. I've felt this myself as a VC. Um, you will get so many like pieces of feedback and you will be tweaking that deck every day, every week. Um, and so think about trying to remember to tweak six decks instead of one or two decks instead of one. Um, so what I've done personally that for the fund, which I would recommend to founders too, is like have maybe a short teaser deck um, that you send out ahead of calls um, and make sure it has enough information in it because some teaser decks are just like, here's my company name, we do, and here's our website or photo of our website. And like, I didn't learn anything, so I still don't know what your business model is. Um, but make sure that like kind of the key points are in there. Um, and then, um, and then live, like have more slides in the appendix or skip slides, um, that like they don't come out in a PDF that you're putting into doc send, but they are there when you're live, you know, bringing something in, up in a discussion or sending something after a discussion. And then send that full deck um, after the, the discussion if it went well and the person seems like they're going to be diving in. So um, I definitely think that um, it's just too much work to have like multiple decks that you're maintaining. Um, unless you're doing something like you're raising grant money for something or raising from um, like it, like uh, like uh, you're raising debt on one end and then you're raising BC money on another end for some reason. Like different sorts of investors that way you may need to do that. But um for the most part, I would just try to keep it simple. Yeah, that's that's incredible advice. And is it is it uh, different from how you raise for uh, VC? How, how you raise for how you raise money for VC funds? Uh, is it how does it differ from the fundraising process for startups? Is it? it I've asked yeah. I asked this question to Michael Kim whether it is easier to raise funds for a startup or a VC fund. He says that he said that it is much harder to raise funds for a VC fund. What do you think? I'm so glad that Michael said that because I would be shocked if he said different. And I think a lot of people don't don't know how hard it is to raise a VC fund. Um, and so uh, I would completely agree. I think it's harder to raise a VC fund. That said, I don't want to come across as not thinking it's hard to raise for a startup. I think it's hard for everyone right now. But I think what makes it particularly hard and painful sometimes is that the timeline is just so long to raise a fund. It's like a, a slow burn for like one to two years. Um, and with a startup, you know, you can have a fundraise that lasts for four weeks. Th- you know, three months is hopefully the max, but um, 
you can you can go in with a process, contact everybody you know. Um, VCs advertise themselves so you can find them and build a list and research actually works versus um, it being like, hey, I'm going to meet these people and pitch them and then they're going to introduce me to these people and then they're going to introduce me to these people because none of them advertise themselves online as LPs. Um, some do, but not many. So um, I think that is what makes it the hardest is that it's like a, a marathon versus a sprint. Um, and it kind, kind of feels like you're sprinting the whole time in the marathon. So um, it's definitely harder. And then I think there's more appetite to invest directly in startups. I think there are folks that, um, there's some folks that should be investing in direct startups. And then I also think there's quite a few folks that should not be investing directly in startups that want to. Um, and I think there's a lot of content out there about how anybody can invest in startups. Um, and I'm sometimes one of those content creators, like I run an angel community and I believe that any operator can become an angel investor. But I also see you know, folks that don't have any tech experience wanting to invest in tech companies. And um, when I sometimes ask them how their portfolios are performing and the types of companies they've been investing in, I feel worried for them because I, I realize that they do not know like what is going to be sticky and what's going to take off. And they're throwing tons of money into those areas. So um, I think just like having a pulse on the industry, the tech industry, and then also pulse on these like industries that whatever tech you're investing in are serving um, is important. And then having enough time and bandwidth um, to invest in all of them. So um, I think there's there's kind of like a glorification of angel investing or direct investing right now that's going, going on. And um, I honestly think a lot of folks have already been, been burned by that and are still going to be getting burned by that in the next couple of years. Um, and, but because of that optics issue um, and everybody being like, I don't want to pay fees, I can do this myself. Um, I think that that, uh, you know, that makes it harder to raise a VC firm. Yeah. I think uh, I think Michael's points were on the somewhat of the same lines because it takes more money from the VC in order to raise the VC fund as compared to founders. So uh, yeah, he said that unless the VC is not being broke themselves, they should keep uh, at it and raise the VC fund. But yeah, I think yeah. I'll ask just last two questions. One is which I ask to everyone, and one is which uh, as an operate as an operating investor, as a person who is an operator and invest in op, invest in operators. What do you like to see in pitch decks yourself? What should found in? Yeah. You? Um. Honestly, I just want to see that it's been thought through. They hit on all the key points. Um. And that. And honestly, some people would hate me for saying this, but I do like to see that it has like a good level of design. That doesn't mean like fancy. It doesn't mean yeah. like everything has been custom designed. I just want to see that it's clean and straightforward. Um, because I think that translates into how much they um, care about their product and how it comes across to customers. If they don't care about their business looking professional in front of investors, then or they don't have an eye for what a good uh, like pitch deck looks like, um, then do they have an eye for what a good product looks like that a, a company is going to want to purchase or a cus- consumer is going to want to use? Um, it just calls into it calls into question some things for me, especially as someone who believes in like product driven leaders. Um, and so that, uh, that's important to me, but honestly, I think pitch decks have been, um, pretty well outlined at this point. I think as long as you hit on all the key parts, um, like, you know, I want to see that, um, I want to know who the team is, um, what's special about them. And it doesn't need to be paragraphs and paragraphs. You can just kind of show like logos of where you've worked and maybe like, you know, a couple measurable things that you've done. Like I've spent five plus years of experience in supply chain and I've done this and that, that or like I, you know, I grew up on a farm, which is why I'm building technology for agriculture. Um, and I also have a PhD in machine learning and computer science. And so I, you know, I'm, you know, ready to build the tech, but I also understand the customer, that sort of thing, just like two to three bullets max on um, the team or you as a founder. Um, and then also, um, you know, just showing that you understand the competitive l- landscape. So especially in my area, like I invest in a lot of companies that are tackling legacy industries. And so they're usually incumbents that are doing things in a very low tech way um, in those industries. And so I want to know that, yes, they know who the incumbents are, which is obvious to anyone, but then they also know what are the other emerging startups in my space, um, which is a little harder to know. Um, And so I want to see that they've at least identified most of those and really thought through where do they fit in and like what is going to make them different. Um, and, and some of this is just the check the box activity. It's like, everybody has the competitive landscape slide with the graph, with the four quadrants. And, um, it's just a matter of showing that you've gone through the actions. Um, and then I think the go to market strategy, um, is probably the most important thing in a a pitch deck. And 
it's tough at pre-seed because you're still kind of in research mode. You're still getting your first customers, still getting your first revenue. Um, but I think that go-to-market slide shows that you've thought through a unique way to distribute your product. Um, and so, like, I think folks that are just like, you know, it's uh, no matter what, what we have to do as VC funds, folks that are like, we're just going to talk to people who will give us introductions, who will talk to people and give us introductions. Not inspiring um, for like a B2B SaaS company. I want to know that they have like a partnership where they're going to get introduced to multiple, um, you know, different potential customers or, um, yeah, or maybe there's like a referral channel that is really strong with them, or maybe one of them was in the industry that they're going to be serving and has a Rolodex of connections to start with that they're not going to burn out of really fast. Um, so I just, I want to see that there's been a lot of thought put into like, what's that initial market wedge that you're going to be selling to? How are you going to actually tackle that market? And then where can you go to after that? Um, is that the be all end all market size or are there different areas you can expand this product into? So I like to see that that's been really well thought through, even knowing that things could change along the way. Ultimately, I'm making a founder bet at the end of the day that I'm investing in a founder that is going to go in with a clear plan like that, but then understand when is it time to adapt that that plan and potentially change it if it's not working. But I do want to know that they've gone through the the thought process um, and they have a clear plan to, to get off the ground. Yeah, incredible. I think the last point uh, stuck out to me because I had uh, Martin Tobias a while ago and he also I talked about uh, yeah inc- so he's an incredible investor I, I mean he the last point he mentioned during that recording to like the thin, thin edge of the wit uh, and I, I might be calling it by the wrong name but what he basically told me that if a company says that they have access to 10,000 people on discord server or something like that which is different and unique then uh, he would rather invest in that company as compared to it. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. Awesome. Martin's awesome. We met in um, Asia, I think, two weeks ago. So we're definitely, we like similar areas. So we'll be sharing deal flow. Yeah. The, the Hustle Fund uh, meetup, I think. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think I saw that. Awesome. So I think uh, just the last question what advice would you like to give to the young builders and the young founders? Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, stick with it. And um, it's a tough environment that everybody's going through right now. But I think, um, honestly, I think if you're listening to podcasts like this and um, trying to learn, like, how can you best organize your fundraise and um, be strategic about when you need to raise, um, I think that's going to go a long way. Um, I think if you have the opportunity to bootstrap and get a little bit farther, you'll get better terms. And um, yeah, I think that that that's uh, important, but I'm really excited for this next generation of founders. And um, I think we're sitting in one of the most exciting times period with everything that's going on in AI. Yeah. Um, I, I don't view this as like a trend that's just going to blow up in our faces, um, you know, similar to previous trends. Um, I think this is a technology we've always known about that it was coming um, and it finally reached a level of maturity that is going to be meaningful. And so um, I see a lot of um, founders leveraging that. Um, and I know we didn't talk much about AI on this podcast, but um, but I think it's interesting that um, even in my own portfolio, even though I'm not like an AI fund, quote unquote, um, I am trying to make sure that every company in our portfolio and every company I'm looking at actually has an AI strategy. So maybe they are AI second, maybe they're, they have a core product that's working and now it's just going to work even better three times faster because they're leveraging AI. Um, and then I also like pure AI companies that are just going to be up leveling all these industries on the levels tech, because as you think about it, um, like, you know, a, a company in a different space, like construction, um, they don't have the budget to hire the best software engineers in the world, like a tech company does. And so if they can use a no code tool to uh, leverage AI to be able to get work tasks done to the same degree that a tech company would with a huge team and large budget, um, that's going to be huge. And so for me, I'm excited about those areas too, that are kind of horizontal solutions, but they are going to be up leveling everyone um, and getting everybody onto the same playing field. So I think it's an exciting time to be a founder. Um, I think that if you are building in that space um, of AI, you just need to make sure that um, you're differentiating and that you don't have too much platform risk. I think there's a lot of like um, AI wrapper stuff going on that isn't super differentiated. So um, those are all challenges, but I think if you're working on something super unique or infrastructure related, um, it could be really powerful. So, yeah. For sure. Yeah, I, I think this has been incredible. We passed the time limit a little bit, but uh, I think that's it from my side. Anything you'd like to say? 
Um, yeah, I mean, if you're uh, founding something in, in a legacy industry, um, I would love to hear from you. So um, we have a pitch form on our website called the council.co slash pitch dash us. You'll find it even if you just go to the council.co. Um, we have a founder tab. You can find us there. Um, and definitely write down that you found out about me on the podcast um, and, and I'll see that um, and our team will flag it and we'd love to take a look. Um, and um, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Amber Illig, A-M-B-E-R-I-L-L-I-G. And I would love to keep in touch that way. Awesome. That, that, that's incredible. I'll link it in the show notes too. Uh, awesome.